Hello, I'm Jeremy Nichols, and I make salt glazed teapots that feature open handles. And this is the story of how these designs came about. The story of any such work can't be entirely separated from the story of its maker. So in the first few slides, I'll be saying a bit about my time before I became a potter and that has fed into the development of my work with teapots. Then I'll look at how, in my ceramic training, my ideas began to take shape. And finally, I'll show the steps from the first prototypes of these teapots to the current versions. As is often the case, the story actually starts in my childhood and my love and fascination with aeroplanes and flying. I grew up making and flying model aircraft, starting with airfix kits as an eight-year-old and eventually graduating to sophisticated high-performance machines the type in the main picture. No photos of my own model survived from these years, unfortunately, but this was the kind of thing I was making. I loved full-sized aircraft too, and spent many happy hours at air shows and airport viewing platforms, where, in the early 60s, the VC-10 was the pride of the UK civil aviation industry. Looking back on it now, this was my first introduction to the concept of form follows function. And with the VC-10 and many other aircraft, in my eyes, both then and now, the form that function gives rise to is inherently both graceful and satisfying. This isn't the case with all functional objects, of course. And in this talk, I'll aim to show something of my solution to the problem of reconciling expressive form with utilitarian function. I went on to study aeronautical engineering at Manchester University. And though this had seemed a logical progression, I soon realized that my interest had been in the making as much as in the aircraft of my making model aircraft. And this of course couldn't be satisfied by the equation solving business of studying fluid mechanics. So from poring over plans of my next model, I now find myself poring over equations such as these shown here. But what has stayed with me from this time, and has a strong place in my work now, is the discipline of experimentation and record keeping, and the skills of analysis and problem solving. I emerged with a degree, but, unconvinced that I wanted a career in industry, I went travelling to clear my mind and think about my future. During my year off travelling in South Asia, I discovered a new world of both cultural and visual stimulation and immersed myself in it. The colours and geometry of Islamic architecture, for example as here in Isfahan, struck a particular chord and when, 30 years later, I was considering the two broad areas of colour that work best with salt glaze, it was the deep, intense blues of these Safavid tiles that I went back to. I returned to the UK to retrain as a social worker and embark on what was to become a 20-year career in this field. It was during this time that I discovered clay and started attending evening classes as recreation. I learned to throw and make work in the traditions of Bernard Leach and of English country pottery, both of which I greatly admired. So that's what I made, as here on the left. This was also the time I first came across the technique of salt glazing, in which I now work, through the pots of Mick Casson and Walter Keeler. Meeting Mick Casson at this point was particularly important for hearing him say, you don't have to make what you admire, and going on to speak of his admiration for the work of Richard Slee, which was of a very different nature to his own work, as can be seen from the images on the right of this slide. And seeing Wally Keeler demonstrate his techniques of altering and assembling to make his pots made me realise that the constructional way of working that was natural to me from my childhood days with balsa wood models could equally be applied now to my working with clay. My interest in ceramics intensified and in 1994 I got a place on Westminster University's 
workshop ceramics degree course at Harrow. The course combined an intense practical training in making and firing with a more academic component looking at design theory and history in a wider context. So I arrived on the course with some basic throwing skills, an aptitude for construction, an appreciation of complex form and an interest in the connection between form and function. At Harrow, I was introduced to contemporary architecture and developed a particular interest in the work of Santiago Calatrava, on the left his cable stayed bridge in Seville, and Frank Gehry, on the right his design museum for the Vitra Furniture Company at Val Amrain. This enabled me to start thinking in more depth about the connections between form and function, function in the sense of utility that is, and in particular what compromises you can make to utilitarian function in your search for expressive form before the object you're making becomes something else, such as a sculpture, or in Philippe Stark's reported words about his famous juicer, something to start conversations. I visited the Design Museum at Weil am Rhein to see what I could learn in this respect, both from Gehry's architecture and the museum collection. Along with the complex and intriguing form of the building itself, the pieces in the collection that stood out for me were Mark Newson's wonderfully curvaceous Lockheed Lounge and Rietveld's angular red-blue chair. The concepts behind these the lucky lounge and the red blue chair, seem to stand in sharp contrast to the concepts behind the work of the Bauhaus designers we were studying on our course. For example, Marcel Breuer and his tubular metal furniture that, though considered radical at the time in the 1920s, was designed for production. This is his club chair on the left, and on the right, a page from a 1927 sales catalogue pointedly promoting it for its functionality. This comparison between the worlds of the Lockheed Lounge and Red Blue Chair and the ethos of the Bauhaus was very much in my mind when, in due course, I came to developing my own work with teapots. The Bauhaus was also giving me some ideas from its ceramics. Here is the approach of Theo Vogler, combining a fixed set of elements in different ways to create a range of different teapot forms. I'll be referring back to this later on. Following graduation, I set up my studio here in Broxbourne, Hertfordshire. I wanted to continue working on ideas for combining utility and expression, and the teapot seemed to be the obvious vehicle for this. In the same way that, as I had seen, a standard cable stayed bridge can be transformed, Calatrava's Seville Bridge here again, so might I be able to do something with a classic teapot shape. I decided the handle was the key and, with flight as a theme, started with pan handles. My idea was that by arranging handle and spout to be in line, I could both reference wings and express movement. Here are a couple of my preparatory sketches on the left and the first extremely clunky prototypes on the right. The next version on the top left here was only slightly less clunky, but the form gradually became more refined as it progressed. And by the time of the third in this series, it had created a certain amount of interest. With these, I also began my method of making, which continues today. That is to say, the bodies and lids are thrown on the wheel, and the handles and spouts are slip cast in plaster moulds. Encouraged by the interest these pots were getting, I pressed on with a further version as here, but was beginning to feel that the expression versus function balance wasn't where I wanted it to be. 
A cantilevered handle is fine for the side handle of a teapot, but doesn't really work ergonomically as an inline handle. And then at this point, rather fortuitously, I came across this very ergonomic bread knife. And this gave me the idea of taking the then current handle and repositioning it vertically as here. With a new body and spout, as in this following version, I got a pot with a certain kind of visual flow that I rather liked. But the ergonomics still weren't really right. It was still more on the Lockheed Lounge side of the utility versus expression balance than on the Marcel Breuer club chair side. The solution, obvious in retrospect, was to bring the handle right over the top of the body. This now did work ergonomically, and the handle's relationship to the spout gave the pot a kind of energy that I felt could be worked on and developed further. This form of handle, arching over the teapot body, now provided me with my central idea. I went back to Theo Borgler's principle of mixing and matching to create multiple designs from a fixed range of elements and set about designing some new handle, spout, body and lid forms. The handles on the pot shown here were the first of this new generation and though tweaked several times over the years, they've been a constant presence in my lineup ever since. It was also exciting to see that it was possible to alter the physical and visual balance of a design, and thus its whole character, simply by playing around with the relative articulation of the handle and spout. So the positioning of the handle on the pot on the left, the very first of this series, gave it a rather slumped look. But by opening the handle up a bit, as on the right, the pots that followed were given, I felt, a lot more verve and energy. Amongst some of the others in this new generation of handles was this one, used in a series of designs as here and inspired by a car handbrake. This particular family, developed from the first version top left, culminated in the version bottom right. This final version, on the whole, worked well particularly in terms of its physical and visual balance. On the other hand, the version in the bottom left of the main picture was an experiment that I didn't take any further. Ideas spawn ideas, and in another teapot I made for a number of years, all four elements, handle, spout, body and lid, contain and combine features from the corresponding elements in two of its predecessors. Around this time too, I was looking at more orthodox sources of ideas than bread knives and handbrakes. And in this group of pots, I used the spout shape of a coffee pot from my earlier travels in the Middle East. The pot on the bottom right was probably the most successful of these in terms of its overall coherence. I was by now trying out the adding of foot rings. As I'll show in the next slide, I took forward the footring form from the pot at the top, and it's this form, tapering slightly in rather than splaying out, as at the bottom left, that's become a feature of many of my pots since. Here then is the progression of these tapering in footrings, gradually increasing in depth from the top left. The pot on the right shows the proportion that in the main I've adopted and represents a good compromise between visual lift and functional stability. The pot on the bottom left is about as far as I'd want to go in terms of the sense of stability conveyed by the form, though from a practical point of view it's fine. This slide also illustrates the mixing and matching of elements that I referred to earlier combining different handles and spouts with different bodies and lids. 
Up to now, I've been talking about solving design problems. Before I conclude by coming up to date with recent and current work, I want to say something about the technical problems that had to be solved to achieve these open handles. At the temperature to which these pots are fired, about 1300 degrees centigrade, clay softens, and without support in the kiln during firing, the handles would collapse. These two pictures show the support structures I use to prevent this happening. For larger pieces, I suspend a joist cut from a kiln shelf between two clay towers that are placed either side of the pot. A small clay pillar rises from the centre of the joist to the underside of the handle. During firing, all these clay parts shrink at the same rate as the pot, so the angle of the handle remains constant. For smaller pots, where the downward force of the softening handle is lower, I use a single clay pillar rising from a false lid as the support. At the end of the firing, all these clay support parts, towers, pillars and false lids, are discarded, but the kiln shelf joists can be reused. Coming up to date, the final two slides are of recent and current work. Here are the latest generation of designs based on that original curved handle. The evolution has included the addition of foot rings as I've described, as well as a wide based version as at the top right. There are three different spout shapes represented in this group, and though the lids are all of the same basic type, their profiles do vary. And finally, to complement the curves of the design just shown, a family of more angular pots. Again, these include both foot-ringed and wide-based forms. So that completes the story, which I hope you'll have found of interest. For further information, please visit my website, www jeremynichols.co.uk or contact me at info at and I'll be happy to help in any way I can. Thank you.